Queen's Park Rangers, or like Queen's Park Rangers, have had an eventful decade with a goal that will be in everyone's memory forever. Starting to believe a little bit. Well, Hoyle has got the better of Buxton. Puts it into an area. Keo Zamora. Unbelievable. A board who improved their squad like a FIFA career mode even involved in one of the most bizarre transfer sagas ever known to man. Oh no, fine, West Brom is my home, but it's a new chapter to start in my life. You know, I love West Brom and always will. But, How excited you know, are you about this Oh, I think every football fan is interested to see if we're going to, you know, uh, make it or not. I, I'm very optimistic about it. Will you definitely be keeping our player as of this evening? Uh, well, it's not 100%. It's not sorted yet, but I hope West Brom will be happy with what, uh, what uh, they will get. But before we look at what happened in the past decade, we take a look back at the history of this club based in Shepherd's Bush. Without any further ado, here is the story of Queen's Park Rangers. <music> Queen's Park Rangers FC were founded in 1882, but formed in 1886 by merging two clubs. They were St. Jude's Institute, formed in 1884, and Christchurch Rangers formed in 1882. QPR became a professional team in 1889 and were elected into the Southern Football League 10 years later. They first won the Southern Football League in 1907-08. However, the topic in this chapter is Queen's Park Rangers finding a place to play their football. They played their home games in nearly 20 different stadia, a league record by the way. The club played on two grounds within Park Royal. The first was Horse Ring, but they were forced to move out in February 1915 as the ground was taken over by the army. The team briefly played at White City between 1931 and 32. Eventually, they had to settle for Loftus Road in 1917. So now Queen's Park Rangers have a ground. How did they fare when they joined the Football League in 1920? Throughout the 20s and the 30s, they were not promoted or relegated from Division 3 South. They were in risk, however, for not being elected twice after finishing rock bottom within 1924 and 1926. But luckily, they kept their place in the third division in both occasions. QPR had to be patient to touch success. Maybe the appointment of Dave Manuel as player manager could achieve this success. Dave Manuel did exactly that. Queen's Park Rangers were promoted as champions of Division 3 South in the 1947-48 season. QPR therefore enjoyed four seasons in the second division before being relegated in 1951-52. Prior to the start of the 1959-60 season, we saw the arrival of arguably the club's greatest ever manager, Alex Stock. And what followed in that season, Queen's Park Rangers achieved their biggest win to date a 9-2 victory over Tranmere Rovers in a Division 3 match. Stock and Jim Gregory helped to achieve a total transformation of the club and its surroundings. Five years later, in 1966-67, QPR won Division 3 Championship and also became the first third division club to win the League Cup. On Saturday the 4th of March 1967, they defeated West Brom 3-2 coming back from a two-goal deficit. And as of today, it is still the only major trophy that Queen's Park Rangers have ever won in their history. The star of the show was undoubtedly Rodney Marsh, who scored 44 goals in that season. They won promotion again the following year, and they reached the top flight for the first time in their history. Their climb to the top flight was complete. Unfortunately, their debut in the top division rapidly turned into a disaster. Stock was harshly sacked over the summer. His chief coach, Bill Doden Jr., took over as manager, but after a poor start to the season, he stepped aside in favour of Tommy Doherty, who in turn resigned after only a month. Les Allen was appointed as player manager after Doherty's departure, but he was unable to improve matters and the club were relegated straight back to the second division. After the relegation from the 1968-69 season, QPR wanted to try and get back to the top flight as soon as they can. 
Six new signings in addition to homegrown talents such as Dave Clement and Captain Jerry Francis allowed the club to finish the club runners-up in the Division 2 to Burnley in the 1972-73 season. In 1975-76, Sexton led them to runners-up spot in the first division, missing out on the league title by a single point after completing their 42-game season. QPR sat on the top of the first division a point ahead of Liverpool who had to win their final game of the season against Wolves to snatch the title away from QPR. They did so, so that means Queensborough Rangers missed out on winning the title by one point. With their first entry of European football, they reached the quarterfinals of the UEFA Cup, losing to AEK Athens on penalties in the quarterfinals. In the summer of 1977, Sexton moved to Manchester United and was replaced by his assistant, Frank Sibley, who became the youngest manager in the history of the Football League. 1978-79, it proved to be a thoroughly dismal season. The club were relegated after winning just six league games. The club were relegated again. as manager in 1980. In 1981, the club installed a plastic pitch. The technology was very unpopular and the measure was reversed in April 1988. So for seven years, QPR had a plastic pitch made of actual turf, the first ever club to do this. The first game on plastic was against Luton Town and they themselves became the second club to use an artificial pitch. In that same season, QPR reached the FA Cup final for the only time in the club's history facing holders Tottenham Hotspur. The game ended 1-1 after extra time and so they had to use a replay, but Tottenham won the replay 1-0 with the only goal coming from Glenn Hoddle. The following season, however, 1982-83, QPR went on to win the second division championship and really comfortably in the end, they returned to England's top division, but in the following year, Terry Venables was departed from QPR and joined to become the manager of Spanish club Barcelona. I mean, QPR to Barcelona, what a deal that is for Terry Venables. Venables was then replaced by Alan Mullery. The club's league was generally good, but Mullery was sacked and replaced by former manager Frank Sibley in December 1984. The season deteriorated and after a bizarre run of form, they only saw them escape relegation by Norwich City losing their last game. Frank Sibley was inevitably sacked following how close QPR were to getting relegated. Jerry Francis, a key player in 1970's Queensborough Rangers side, was appointed manager in the summer of 1991. In the 1991-92 First Division season, they finished mid-table in the league and they were the founder members of the brand new Premier League which began in 1992. Francis oversaw one of Queensborough Rangers most famous victories, a 4-1 win over Manchester United at Old Trafford which was helped by a hat-trick scored by Dennis Bailey. They finished that season in 5th place and in the following season, Francis guided them to a 9th place finish. Midway through the 94-95 season though, Francis resigned and very quickly became the manager of Spurs. Way Wilkins was then installed as player manager and Wilkins led Queensborough Rangers to an 8th place finish in the Premiership but they also reached the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. In July 1995 though, things started going wrong. They sold their top goal scorer Les Ferdinand for £6 million to Newcastle. Ray Wilkins failed to find a successful replacement for Ferdinand and this was a major factor in QPR's relegation at the end of the 95-96 season. Q, Queensborough Rangers is full. competed in Division 1 under a succession of managers, including Stuart Houston and Ray Harford. Jerry Francis returned in 1998 and for a while stabilised the club, but in the 2001 season it proved to be a disaster, the only bright spark being the emergence of future England international Peter Crouch. Francis resigned in early 2001 to be replaced by former player Ian Holloway, but it was too late and the club were relegated to England's third tier for the first time in more than 30 years. Within five years of being in the Premiership, Queensborough Rangers find themselves in Division 2. Unbelievable drop for Queensborough Rangers. Holloway revived his fortunes and finished 8th in the 2001-02 season, 4th in the following season, losing in the playoff final 2 to Cardiff City, 
but they finally got promoted back to Division 1 in 0304 when they finished second and they got promoted. On the 6th of February 2006, Holloway was suspended amidst rumours of his departure to join Leicester City. He was then replaced by former player Gary Waddock. In the 0506 season, it was a difficult one for QPR both on and off the pitch. Financial troubles were starting to arise. Boardroom issues combined with a series of poor performances and defeats was what really affected their season. It was a winless run from the end of February to the end of the season, which saw Rangers drop to a 21st position. Very close, but not quite relegated from QPR. And if you think that things were going to get tough here, it gets even tougher later on for QPR. For 10 years from the mid-1990s and the late 2000s, Queensborough Rangers were embroiled in a financial and boardroom controversy. The club voted on the alternative investments market in 1996 and the instigation of Chris Wright. But in 2001, following the relegation from the Premiership and the number of seasons in the second tier, the club was obliged to enter administration. A proposal to merge with Wimbledon was also raised, but proved to be too controversial and was dropped by Queen's Park Rangers. Debts were rumoured to be close to 20 million. There was a scandal involving directors, shareholders and other interested parties during the 0506 season, following allegations of blackmail and threats of violence against the club's then chairman, Gianni Paldini. He was allegedly held at gunpoint during a match at Loftus Road and within that turmoil, very, very sadly, a youth team footballer, Kyan Prince, was murdered on the 18th of May 2006, being the only age of 15, which is why Queen's Park Rangers have temporarily changed their name to the Kyan Prince Foundation Stadium. It was Gary Raddick's role to try and save Queen's Park Rangers on the pitch. The team struggled in the league and as a result in September 2006, Raddick was demoted to first team coach and later left the club. Another former QPR player, John Gregory, replaced him as manager. The club later reverted to previous form and dropped once again to the relegation zone. In an exciting end to the season, QPR secured safety after a run of wins, including beating Cardiff and in the last game of the season, they drew 1-1 to promotion contender Stoke City. QPR finished 18th, a very marginal improvement from the previous season when they finished 21st. The 0708 season started on a very tragic note, the very sad death of player Ray Jones in a car crash at the age of 19. And following this low point in the club's history, Rangers were also faced mounting financial pressure. In this same month, it was announced that the club had been bought by wealthy Formula 1 businessmen, Flavio Baito and Bernie Eccleston. John Gregory's reign as manager came to an end in November 2007 after a string of poor results which left Queen's Park Rangers at the bottom of the championship. He was replaced by Luigi Di Canio. Queen's Park Rangers' form improved a little bit though and he guided them to a secure 14th place finish in the final table. Further investment also involved in the early 2008 courtesy of steel magnate Lakishmi Metal as the club looked to push for promotion to the Premier League within four years. Remarkable ambition from Mittal, but let's see if he can achieve that fate. On 8th of May, Queen's Park Rangers announced that Luigi Di Canio had left the club, and in the following season, Ian Darry was revealed to be Di Canio's replacement six days after the latter's departure. In the 24th of October 2008, Darry was sacked after just 15 games in charge of the club. In November 2008, QPR named former Portugal midfielder Paulo Sousa as their first new first team coach. Sousa was sacked in the 9th of April 2009 after he allegedly divulged confidential information without authority. Player coach Gareth Ainsworth was then appointed as caretaker manager. Jim Magilton took over as manager in June 2009 but left the club in mutual consent in the 16th of December 2009 and replaced by Paul Hart and Mick Harford. But a month and five games after becoming manager of QPR, Hart parted with the club in the 14th of January. Neil Warnock was then appointed manager on the 1st of March 2010 and he guided the club back to the Premier League at the end of the 2010-11 season by winning the championship title. Lashikmi Mittal did say that he would get Chris Rangers in the Premier League within four years he got into the Premier League within three years. Absolutely unbelievable promise that he managed to fulfill for Queen's Park Rangers. Now we enter a brand new era as Queen's Park Rangers enter the Premier League. It's a new life for me. 
The promotion wasn't quite confirmed though. There was an FA investigation involving Chris Moranger's accusation of player Alejandro Fowlin threatened to deduct points from the side and initially put their promotion in jeopardy. The investigation was concluded and it was revealed that the club to be found at fault for two of the seven charges. They received a fine of 875000 but no points deducted. So it meant Queen's Rangers' promotion to the Premier League was secured. Tony Fernandez became the new club's new chairman in the 18th of August 2011 after buying Bernie Ecclestone's 66% majority stake. Fernandez immediately had a money chest to spend and in his Premier League seasons with his Queen's Park Rangers, he hasn't been scared to spend the money, blowing all the money on high wages on quality players like on a FIFA career mode. Here is a couple of examples of players that he spent a load of money on. Bobby Zamora, Sean Wright Phillips, Loic Remy, Christopher Samba, Junior Hoylett, Leroy Fur, Stephen Corker and even Sandro from Spurs. Now, the cheapest of those players was around 3 million, the maximum being paid around 11 million, which is an insane amount of money to be paying all at once in the Premier League. In January 2012, Fernandez appointed Mark Hughes as team manager only 36 hours after Neil Warnock was sacked. Hughes left the club to safety, but in November the 23rd of 2012, Hughes was sacked after a poor start to the 12-13 season. Harry Redknapp was confirmed as the new manager in the very, very next day. And within that season, cue for very bizarre transfer saga between Peter Oden Wingy with West Brom and Queen's Park Rangers. To give you context, Peter Oden Wingy wanted a move to Queen's Park Rangers. Part of the deal involved that Junior Hoylet needed to go to West Brom from QPR. Junior Hoylet, quite frankly, didn't want to go to West Brom. Odin Wingy was unaware of that. He drove all the way to Loftus Road, but because the deals weren't agreed by the two parties, he couldn't speak to the authorities of Queen's Park Rangers. So the people in charge of Queen's Park Rangers had to escort Peter Odin Wingy away from the training ground. And ultimately, the deal was cut short. And ultimately, it was too little too late. Odin Wingy, despite saying goodbye to his West Brom players, had to make an awkward return and had to play with them for the remainder of the 12-13 season. I believe uh, as, as well as they believe. Will you definitely be keeping our player as of this evening? Uh, well, it's not 100%. It's not sorted yet, but I hope West Brom will be happy with what, uh, what uh, they will get. And of course, uh, they're hoping to get few players themselves. So I just hope things will go well in the last few hours. And you finally got your wish after speaking on Twitter over the weekend. Uh, well, you know, had to push a little bit, so... <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Even if Odin Wingy joined, I don't think he would have saved QPR though. Following a 0-0 draw against relegation rivals Reading, both of the clubs were relegated from the Premier League down to the Championship. Harry Redknapp stayed on as manager and tried to get them promoted from the Championship. In the end of that 13-14 season, QPR were in the playoff final and had to play against the favourites Derby County against Steve McLaren. And Q for last minute goal from who? And Q for Limbs. This signalled a return to the Premier League for Queen's Park Rangers. They had a poor start on the 14-15 campaign in the Premier League. Redknapp resigned in February after poor results and mutual frustration with the board. He was then replaced by Chris Ramsey and the team finished the season in last place with only 30 points and were relegated back to the Championship. Now we go back to where Queen's Park Rangers are doing now. Their exile from the Premier League. After a poor start in the following season, Ramsey was sacked in November 2015. Former manager Neil Warnock returned to the club, but in December 2015, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank was appointed the club's new manager and got the club to finish in 12th, a disappointing return to the championship for QPR. Hasselbank was sacked on the 5th of November 2016 after just 11 months. Then six days later, the club reappointed old favourite Ian Holloway. QPR finished 18th and 16th in consecutive seasons, which meant Holloway left the club at the end of the 17-18 season. Just a week later, Steve McLaren was appointed as manager. He got sacked midway through the season after a promising run of form in the turn of the new year. 
John Eustace, who was just linked with Swansea a couple of weeks ago, took charge for only seven games, losing four of them. We've made it to the 1920 season and Mark Warburton was taken in charge. In the 2019-20 season, QPR started well, only being one point off the top six in Halloween. However, a disastrous November-December time saw QPR fall to 15th at the end of the year. Pressure mounted on Warburton. But before the season was halted from the pandemic, he got QPR up to 13th place, 11 points off the relegation spot. In those nine returning games after the pandemic though, QPR disappointingly only picked up 7 points, finishing in 14th. In the start of last season, there was a direct contrast of the season before. They started very poorly, being in 20th place and only 2 points above the relegation zone in the end of 2020. But in the second half of the season, QPR turned it around in style, getting some brilliant transfers in like Stefan Johansson and Charlie Austin. They won 15 of their last 24 matches, only losing 7 of those. That means Queensborough Rangers rose 11 places up to 9th place, their best finish in the championship season since relegation from the Premier League in 2014-15. And now we get to this season. I already spoke my praises on their pre-season beating Manchester United by four goals to two. I've given my praises on the transfer strategy, their shirt design as well. There's a lot of optimism going around about Queensborough Rangers right now. There's a really feel-good feeling about this club. And we'll see if Queensborough Rangers could even build from that ninth place finish from last season and could potentially end their exile away from the top league. But that wraps up the history and the rise and fall of Queen's Park Rangers. Let me know what you think about this club in the comments down below. If you guys want me to do another Football Tales, let me know what team you'd like me to do in the comments down below. Please give the video a like. 20 likes would be appreciative. Please subscribe if you haven't. It does help. And please share the channel also. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care.